Okay, this is the first hour of Physics 1B for November 11th, and last time we talked about the first law of thermodynamics, and we did, I think, one problem toward the end of class, one very short problem. Uh, and so we would like to do some more problems. And to just to remind you, the first law of thermodynamics... states that we can find the change in internal energy <clears throat> of a system by taking the amount of heat that's put into the system minus the amount of work that the system does on its environment. When the system does work on its environment, this is positive. When heat comes into the system, Q is positive. When heat goes out, Q is negative. When work is done on the system, W is negative. Okay, so we'd like to use this to solve, uh, I think, three more problems. And starting with this one right here, so let's get right into it. Uh, it says figure 19.12 shows a PV diagram for a cyclic process. Um, let's make both the figure and the words bigger, just in case people can't see it. Uh, a cyclic process in which the initial and final states of some thermodynamic system are the same. The state of the system starts at point A, which is here and proceeds counterclockwise in the PV diagram to point B. So from A down to B, I don't know if you can see there's an arrow right here. So we go from A to B uh, and proceeds counterclockwise, the PV diagram to B, then back to A. It says the total work is negative 1,500 joules. And the first question is why is the work negative? Why is the work negative? Anyone want to answer that? How do we find the work in this case? More area covered. Total area from B to A is greater than from A to B, yep. And when we go backwards, when we're doing area and we go backwards, it's negative, right? So since A to B has a smaller area, which is the area just down here, and then B to A includes the whole area, then while the work is positive from A to B, the work is negative when we go back from B to A. That's right. Remember the work is the area under the curve, as it says right here, the area enclosed by the path, the total work W, done by the system, the process, in this case, W is zero. And um, the path itself encloses this area. And they're saying the total work done has to be what that, that area right there is of just inside of the path itself. Because that's going to be the difference between the area of this large thing and the area of this smaller thing down here will be this part. Okay. That's part A. Um, basically, areas. We find work by finding area. Uh, part B says to find the change in internal energy and the heat added during this process. How can we do that? It says to find the change in internal energy and to find the heat added. That would be Q. Q equal to W. Well, why that might be hmm, U is zero. Why is U zero? You're saying the internal energy of this uh, system is zero? Same start and end point, but that doesn't mean the internal energy is zero. The change in internal energy is zero. That's right. It's not that U is zero. We know that the change in internal energy has to be zero because it starts at point A and it goes around like this and it ends at point A. This is always going to be true in anything where you have a cyclic process. If it brings it back to the same thermodynamic state, then we believe that the energy of that state has to be the same. So because it's a cyclic process, that means that the change in internal energy is zero, which means as... No, was saying Q is equal to W, so the amount of energy 
that flows into the system is negative 500 joules, which means there's actually energy flowing out of the system. Okay. Pretty easy. Anyone have any questions? Again, this means that Okay, pretty simple. All right, so we'll go on to another one. So this one is about um, different paths taken. This one actually has some numbers in it. Okay, so comparing thermodynamic processes. The PV diagram of figure 19.13 shows a series of thermodynamic processes in process a b which goes from here to here 150 joules of heat is added to the system in process b d 600 joules of heat is added to the system find a the internal energy change in the process a b b the internal energy change in process a b d which would be from here to here to here and c the total heat added in process a c d which is from here to here to here Okay, so we can write some things down. It says in the process AB, 150 joules of heat is added to the system. So we know here that Q is equal to 150 joules. Maybe call it QAB or something like that. And then it says in the process BD, 600 joules is added, so we'll call this QBD is 600 joules. Part A, we want to find the internal energy change in the process AB, so delta U for process AB. Okay, how can we do that? What do you guys think? this. What this means is that the scale from this point to this point is not equivalent to the scale from this point to this point. It means that um, even though, does that make sense? Yeah. This is zero, but then this is three times 10 to the four, and that's eight times 10 to the four. So technically, this should be a little bit lower, but it doesn't, doesn't matter that much. It didn't do it on this axis, which I guess is reasonable because if this is zero to two, this could be two to five. All right, so the question is, how do we find the change in internal energy along process AB? Area under the curve. That's not really an answer. It's just a statement about something we could do. How do we find how do we how do we translate that into finding the energy then? The change in energy. Constant volume, what does that tell us? Work is equal to zero, that's right. Because the work, oops, in general, the work done is going to be equal to the integral of pressure dV, right? And if the volume is constant, so the endpoints of this will be constant, then the work is going to be equal to zero, which means that delta U, which is normally equal to uh, Q minus W, then now we can say that this is zero. So the change in internal energy has to be equal to the heat that comes into the system from A to B, which we know is equal to right here, 150 joules. Okay, so constant volume means that uh, the work 
done by the system is going to be equal to zero. The system can't do any work if it doesn't expand, basically what that means. Okay, part B says to find the internal energy change in process ABD. It's a different color for this part. Okay, so now again, we know that this is equal to Q minus W. And from A to B to D, we know that the total energy that comes in, the total heat that comes in, is going to be 150 plus 600, okay? We could make a triangle and we go, no, we're not going to make a triangle. No, we're not going to make a triangle. What? You mean a triangle like this? I don't think so. We're not going to draw any new lines on this picture. Um, we just need to be able to calculate the Q, which we know. The Q is 750 joules, which we get from taking the Q from here to here, and then the Q from here to here to get the total amount of heat that comes in. So 150 plus 600. And then here we just have to do minus area. I'll just put minus the area. Because the work is equal to the integral of PDV, which is the same thing as finding the area under the curve, right? So all we have to do is to find the area under this entire box right here. And actually, all the way down to here, right? We need, we need the whole area, right? Would you all agree? Which one do we need, actually? You tell me. Do we want just the area of the upper rectangle, or do we want the whole area? Yeah, we need the whole area, all the way down to the bottom. All of this. OK. All right, so to do that, the area is going to be equal to um, the height times the width. OK, so the height is going to be from here all the way up to here, which is going to be equal to the, the pressure, basically, which is equal to uh, 8 times 10 to the 4 pascals. And then the width is from here to here. That's going to be our volume. And we, you can see what that is. I'm not going to write it, but it's 5 minus 2. So the area is just going to be equal to 750 joules minus, I'm going to write it like this, pressure times change in volume, because pressure is constant. Well, it's constant from B to D. It's not constant from A to B. So we'll have 750 joules minus the pressure, the max pressure, which is 8 times 10 to the 4 pascals. And then the change in volume is 5 minus 2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed. So this is equal to 2. You know, I didn't say that, Troy. No, I didn't say that. I wrote this, and the 4 got connected across the top. Oh. And I'm sure you've seen that happen before in this class, so you shouldn't be surprised. It just happens. It's just part of the way this program works. I fixed it. OK, what is this equal to? Uh, 5 minus 2 is 3. 3 times 8 is 24. 24 times 10 is 240. From this will be 510, I think. Okay. You don't have any questions? Let's see if we have enough room to do C here. Let's erase some of this stuff. OK. Part C says the total heat added in the process ACD. So now we want to find the heat added in the process A to C to D, which is now going from here to here to here. Okay, and for this, where should we start? How should we be thinking about this?
Okay, looking at it, what does that do for us? We look at path taken. What does that do? I would disagree. That's not where you should. My question is, where should you start thinking about this? You're trying to find the heat added. What should be your fundamental equation that you would use, your fundamental principle that you would start with as the way you're thinking about how you need to get there? Look at the path taken is not the correct answer. We can look at it. What does that do for anybody that's trying to solve this? How would you start to think about this? Find the work from A to C. Again, that might be something that we want to do down the line. My question is, how do you start thinking about it? What's the first principle you're, you're thinking of in terms of how you find this Q? Here you go. Delta U is equal to Q minus W. Okay, W is here. And Asher Elber mentioned that we're going to have to find the work from A to C. That's right, because it shows up right there. So we're trying to find A to C to D. And we can do that. Um, that Q, we can find the Q here, right? As long as we can find um, the work done, which we know we can do this, right? We don't have to worry about this. We know we can do this. What about this, then? This will be an unknown. How will we find what that is equal to? How are we going to figure out what delta U is? Yeah, um, we started from point A, and so if we look, let's look at part B. Part B, we went from A to B to D. So we basically went from this point to this point. Uh, in C, we're going along a different path from A to C to D, but these two states right here, A and D, should have the same change in energy. So delta U from here should be the same because the, the endpoints are the same, basically. We couldn't do that if we only went from A to C, but because we already found the change in internal energy from A to B to D should be the same as from A to C to D, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? All right, I emphasize starting from this equation because one of the biggest things that I've noticed from grading not only homeworks but also exams, this is a hint for when you're solving the exam, the people that seem to be getting the worst scores, they're missing this, this key point, which is that you start homework problems from some first principle from some idea. In this case, the principle is the the first law of thermodynamics, right? If you're if you're starting your uh, if you're starting your problem by doing some other work, then you're probably going to make mistakes. <laughs> the best way I can say it, it'd be like starting a Newton's law problem and not drawing a free body diagram, or starting an energy problem and not kind of like labeling p points on your picture for heights and stuff like that. That's what I'm getting a lot of, and it's causing people to miss a lot of points. So. Kind of emphasize that you need to be working from first principles. If you don't understand what that means, please say something. All right, so let's do this calculation. Q should be equal to uh, delta U plus W. And for W, we're going to be doing um, P times change in volume again, because this is kind of a, con it's not a constant volume process, it's a constant pressure process. Yep, Pat, that's right. Yep, exactly. Okay, so delta U we said was 510. The pressure from A to C to D now is going to be 3 times 10 to the 4 pascals. Multiply by change in volume. There's only a change in volume between here and here. From C to D, there is no change in volume, so there'll be no work. So we multiply this times, again, 5 minus 2, the change, times 10 to the minus 3. Just barely fitting this on the screen. And then this is going to be, looks like 510 minus 90, so 420, maybe? Is that right? Oh, it's not subtracted, it's plus. I'm stupid. Oops. 510 plus 90, which would be 600 joules. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, does that make sense? You don't have any questions? These problems really aren't that hard. It's nice when you have... Um, just, I mean, it's just a really simple equation, you know? Okay, any questions about this one before we move on? So it says one gram of water, one centimeter cubed, becomes 1,671 centimeters cubed of steam when boiled at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. The heat of vaporization at this pressure is that compute A, the work done by the water when it vaporizes, and B, its increase in internal energy. So we've got a very small amount of water. That gets turned into steam. So here we have a volume that's equal to one centimeter cubed, and it turns into steam. That has a volume of 1671 centimeters cubed. So this is kind of like our initial volume, final volume kind of deal. Um, it says it's boiled at a constant pressure of one atmosphere, so we know the pressure in both cases is going to be equal to And they're also giving us the heat of vaporization, which we could have looked up, but We want to find a the work done by the water when it vaporizes and B the increase in internal energy, which is the change in internal energy All right, what do you all think? How do we find part A? How do we find the work done? Work equal to Q, Q minus delta U, okay. It's true. I don't think it's gonna work in this particular case. It's constant pressure, so work, that's right. So in general, the, this would be equal to the integral of pressure dV, but if the pressure is constant, we pull the pressure out of the equation, it's just the integral of dV, which is just P times the change in volume. So that's what we're gonna do for part A. For part A, we're gonna say that the work is equal to pressure times change in volume. So pressure was 1.013 times 10 to the five Pascals. We multiply by delta V, which is gonna be 1671 centimeters cubed minus one centimeter cubed. And then we wanna convert this into meters cubed. So we'll multiply by one meter over 100 centimeters cubed. Should work. So this is gonna give us Something like 167, maybe a little bit more, maybe like 170. Why don't you all calculate and tell me what you get? I'm probably off. 169, pretty close. Okay. Uh, Troy says, can we start with Q equal to ML? We've got density and volume to sub for M. Mm, never mind. Uh, yeah, so we want to find the increase in internal energy as well. And for that, you're right, Troy, we are probably going to need to use that equation, that Q is equal to M times LF. Now, water doesn't just naturally turn from steam, from, from liquid into steam. 
right? That's only going to happen if you add heat to the system, right? So you need to hit, you need to put heat into the system to get from state one to state two, right? So we know that heat was put into the system. And we also can quantify exactly how much heat was put in because of this quantity right here. And I agree with uh, what you said, Troy, that we can find the mass because we know the volume, right? So let's do that. So we have one centimeter cubed of water. Um, so let's let's start with uh, let's start with finding the mass. So we know that the mass of water should be equal to its density times its volume. We'll use the initial volume, and the density would be one thousand kg over meter cubed. We multiply by the volume, which was one cm cubed, and then multiply by that same conversion factor right here. Okay. 1,000 over this, this should be mass equal to something like 0.01 kilograms, maybe? Maybe? Put it all, tell me if I'm right or wrong. And then we can find Q. Hopefully I'm not going too fast for here. By taking that mass, I'm going to assume it's right since nobody said anything. not right because a thousand divided by a million is a thousandth my bad okay so 0 0.001 kilograms we're multiplying by 2.256 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram <laughs> it does say one gram of water, doesn't it? That's funny. <laughs> I remember seeing that, but then uh, you know Troy mentioned what he mentions. So it it doesn't hurt. We figured we figured it out anyway. All right, so um, that's going to be the Q. So Q then is going to be equal to um, two, two, five, six joules, I think. All right. So we have the Q, but we were trying to find. Not that, but going back to what they wanted us to find in B was change in internal energy. So now we can go back to our first law of thermodynamics that the change in internal energy should be equal to Q minus W. And since we know Q and W, this is a very simple thing to calculate. So it's going to be 2, 2, 5, 6 joules minus 169 joules. Whatever that's equal to. Let's see. Two zero eight seven. I guess that makes sense. Okay. Do we have any questions? Yep. Its energy went up. Yeah, so where does that energy go? Well, so some of it, um, I mean, when we, call it, when we call it internal energy, remember that, that internal energy is, is a, a sum of all the kinetic energies of the system plus any internal potential energies of the system, such as bonding energy, things like this. Um, so yeah, the energy went up. Heat added, so energy went up, makes sense. It's potential energy plus kinetic energy. I think it's easiest to just think about the kinetic energy because the potential energy part is kind of weird. So I usually just think of change in internal energy as being kind of an increase in kinetic energy. It's the easiest thing to think about, I think. But it is possible that some of the energy goes into the system as well. All right, so that is that for problems that we can solve mostly just using the first law. You'll notice that sometimes you're going to have to rely on things that we've learned earlier in the class, right, like this right here. Um, to be able to um, solve these problems. So that's something to mention for the exam too, is that even though I told you that it only covers those that small number, that small amount of material, um, everything builds, in, builds on itself in physics. So stuff that came early on is also gonna be included. You know, you need to know still how to do calorimetry problems and stuff like that. 
because as you can see, sometimes that, that stuff that we learned early on is gonna show up in these kind of problems too. Okay, so the next thing we wanna talk about are kinds of thermodynamic processes, but um, before we get into that, we wanna specifically talk about um, infinitesimal changes of state, because we're gonna need this for Okay, so we have this equation that we've just been using, which is that change in internal energy is equal to um, Q minus W. But we can imagine a process in which a system only changes by slight degrees, in which case we can say that there's gonna be an infinitesimal change in internal energy of the system when a tiny amount of energy DQ is put into the system and it does a very tiny amount of work DW on its surroundings. And then what we can do is we can say that for the processes that we're going to be describing now, we're always going to be able to say that the work done is just directly related to uh, PDV. So now our equation we could write as du is equal to dq minus PDV. Okay, so this is going to be our kind of general uh, relationship that we're going to be using. You can see it's really not that much different than what we've been using before. Um, but uh, the book kind of emphasizes that we need to be able to have this type of a way of thinking about uh, changes as well. Mostly because we're going to be talking about systems in which we make changes to the system so incredibly slowly that uh, uh, it's going to have an effect on, on how we think about it. Okay, so let's talk about types of processes. How much time do we have right now? Play time. Okay, the first one, which in my memory is the one that comes up the most, is adiabatic. So in an adiabatic process, so it's adiabatic, um, this is where there's no heat transfer into or out of the system. So Q is equal to zero, which means no heat transfer in or out of the system. Okay. And this tells us, um, now, the, there's different possible ways that this could happen. Um, it could be that uh, the process occurs so quickly that there's no time for heat flow. Kind of thinking ahead, I think that... Uh, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think that inside of a car engine, we're going to talk about adiabatic processes because the combustion process is going to be very fast. I could be wrong about that, though. I, I haven't... I don't remember exactly. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so this is um, what an adiabatic process is. There's no heat transfer in or out of the system. So when you see that word adiabatic, I don't I don't know how you're supposed to remember that that has that that, that means no heat. Um, other than that, the the a in front I think is the kind of like you know if we say atheism means you don't believe in God, I think the a in front of this is like the the no part of it, and then then maybe something in the rest of the words is heat, but adiabatic no heat. Try to remember that. I always forget. So I understand if you figured as well. If we look at our equation right here, that means that, or really we can look at the top one right here. For an adiabatic uh, process, we're going to know that uh, delta U should be equal to negative W. Okay. The key to doing these kind of problems that are going to show up for this. Oh, here, yeah, they say in the book, the compression stroke in an internal combustion engine is approximately adiabatic process. The temperature rises as the air fuel mixture in the cylinder is compressed. The expansion of burned fuel during the power stroke is also approximately adiabatic with a, with a drop in temperature. And uh, yeah, we'll look specifically into that. So um, I just will, I'll mention here that sometimes the adiabatic process happens uh, when the, um, if the process is very quick.
Yeah, so if the process happens very quickly, there may be no time for heat to enter or exit the system. Does that seem reasonable? If something happens fast, it's very hard for heat to come into or out of the system. Does that seem reasonable? I'll give you a really simple example, I guess. Let's say you have a cooler and it has uh, like sodas in it that are being cooled. If you open the cooler and leave it open for a really long time, then all those sodas are gonna get warm, right? But if you open the cooler, you reach in and grab a soda out and you close it really quickly, there's gonna be very little time for heat to, uh, to leave the system, right? Does that make sense? Same thing's true for your refrigerator. If you open it, grab something, close it really quick, then most of the things inside are gonna remain cold, right? Okay, so fast might mean adiabatic, okay? All right, let's keep going with types of thermodynamic processes. Okay. So the next one is isochoric. Is this the one that's constant volume? Yeah, this is constant volume. Again, I, I don't know where these names come from, but this is a constant volume process. Now, what do we know then? If it's a constant volume process, what can we, what can we derive from that? About what we know so far. The work is zero, that's right. Constant volume process, and since the work is equal to the integral of P dV, if V is constant, right? That means work is zero. Change in volume is constant, that's like doing an integral where the endpoints are the same, right? And you know that no matter what's inside of the integral, if the endpoints are the same, at the end when you subtract, you're gonna get zero, okay? So if the work done is zero, that means that change in energy now is gonna be equal to just Q, right? you heat a gas in a constant uh, volume container, that would be uh, an example of this, right? So if I have a system where I have a closed container and uh, I add heat at the bottom, and inside of here we have some gas, like, you know, we could have steam or something like this, I don't know. And if we heat this up, then if the, if it's closed container, then the, um, system can't expand. And that means that all the energy that comes in here from the heat source is directly converted into an increase in internal energy of the system. Because that's all that can happen. All the energy that comes in is just gonna directly increase the internal energy because the volume can't change. Now, of course, if the lid is just like laid across here, eventually if you add enough heat, the system's gonna expand, right? And the heat, the steam is gonna start to escape. So uh, you'd have to pressurize this and make sure it actually is held down. Okay, any questions? Can you all tell me um, if I go back to this picture right here? Maybe I'll copy paste it. Let me just copy paste it. First of all, are any of the steps of this process adiabatic? Think about that for a second. Are any of the steps of this process adiabatic? What about isochoric? Are any of the steps of this process isochoric? Definitely, right? Which steps are isochoric? Isochoric means constant volume, so anywhere where there's a straight line, so A to B and C to D, those are isochoric, right? And the answer to the first question about are any of the processes adiabatic, the answer is no. They aren't. There's heat added from A to B, B to D, and we also calculated, remember, if we go back to the problem, we also calculated the heat added from A to C to D, and we found that it was 600 joules, right? We didn't even mention it at the time, but I don't know if anybody noticed this, but the heat from uh, the Q from A to B to D 
was bigger. 750 joules is bigger than 600 joules, right? Even though in both cases, the change in internal energy was the same, um, you needed to add more heat to go along the process from A to B to D to get the same internal energy change, right? Didn't even talk about that, but. Anyway, point is, uh, all of these processes here would be non-adiabatic, as in there is heat coming in, in all cases. But as you said, A to B and C to D would be isochoric. And again, it just means constant volume. <laughs> it would be a lot easier if they named it like ISO, ISO volume or something like that, or ISO volumetric or something. Okay, what's next? Next is isobaric. You can probably guess what this one is. What would you guess isobaric is? Constant pressure. Yep. Because we use barometers to measure pressure. The bar is actually a measurement of pressure. There's nothing wrong with reading the textbook, dude. Um, I mean, when I when I took all of my classes, when I was in college, I, I would just bring the textbook to class and just kind of follow along. I don't know, that's just how I, I never, I never took any notes. I say that to people and they don't believe me, but I never took any notes at all, ever. I just took the textbook to class and just figured out where the stuff that the teacher was talking about was so I could look at it later and that's how I studied. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, okay, so isobaric is constant pressure. And if it's constant pressure, what do we know about that then? Um, yeah, what do we know if, if it's constant pressure? What, what does that tell us? Yeah, so all the things are going to be non-zero. So we're still going to have, for this, the equation we would use would be delta U is Q minus W. I mean, really, this is always the equation you're using, but the difference here is going to be that work, which is normally equal to PDV um, integral. If the pressure is constant, you pull the pressure out, and the integral, we've done this a few times, this becomes just pressure times change in volume, you know, where you can write it as work is equal to pressure times v2 minus v1. The point is that you don't need to do an integral in this case. Uh, you could just write that uh, the work done by the system is going to be pressure times v2 minus v1. Um, boiling water at constant pressure is isobaric, so this problem here, this would be an isobaric problem because the pressure was constant. We're boiling water, but the external pressure was constant. Okay. And uh, one more, and just to reiterate, the, the main reason that I'm mentioning these things is because you're going to see these terms show up in problems. You're going to see the words, again, adiabatic is going to show up a lot. Um, you'll probably not see this one as much, but you will see problems with isobaric. And uh, the whole point is just to know when you see those words that you can attach something to it. So just to review, adiabatic, Q is zero, delta U equal, you don't, as long as you remember the first part, you don't need to memorize the second part, right? Because you just memorize the first law, which is this, right? And if you know Q is equal to zero, you just make it zero, right? So adiabatic, Q equal to zero, isochoric, constant volume, which then means that work is zero. So that, and then isobaric, basically just that this is what's going on. This isn't anything new. We've known this already, but now we just have a word associated with isobaric, with constant pressure. Okay, finally we have isothermal. So thermal. Okay, you want to guess what? That, that's pretty obvious, right? Isothermal is going to be um, temperature is constant, which means delta T is equal to zero. And if delta T is equal to zero, yeah, iso means same. Like isosceles triangle has two sides that are the same. An isomer is something in chemistry. I don't remember what it is. 
something like uh, same type of uh, substance. I don't know what it is. So temperature constant, which is delta T is equal to zero, which I think means that, uh, um, especially in the cases of ideal gases, um, which will be a lot of the problems we're doing, the... Um, well, we haven't said this yet. I guess we're going to say it in the very next section, that in the case of an ideal gas, um, the internal energy, U, is only dependent on the temperature. Not on um, pressure and volume. So, right here. Shouldn't write really long sentences. So in the case of an ideal gas, the internal energy only depends on T. So that means that um, delta U would be equal to zero, which would mean that Q would be equal to W. It's not always going to be the case, but it's going to be for, for a lot of the a lot of the systems um, that we talked about. Basically, that any heat that comes into the system has to be equal to the work that comes into the system. Okay, this is a pretty good place to stop. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I don't see why not, Troy. Okay, Amir is typing something and then after he finishes. For adiabatic, if u is equal to negative w. Wouldn't that mean that heat is exiting the system? Why? Why do you say that? You thought that work done means that energy is leaving the system to the surroundings. Maybe you're making a confusion between work and energy. Um, if a system does work on its environment, that does mean that it's kind of, in a way, endowing its environment with energy. But it doesn't necessarily mean that energy is leaving the system. Well, no, I mean, it does, I guess. It does mean that energy is leaving the system, but it doesn't mean that heat is coming in or out of the system. I think that's the key thing to understand. So if you look at the two things that you wrote in the first statement, you said that heat is exiting the system. In the second statement, you said energy. You see that, Umer? You see the distinction? It's, it is, it, if, if the system does work on its environment, its energy is going to change. That's what this says, right? This says that if if work, let's say that a system does a thousand joules of work on its environment, okay? Then its internal energy is going to go down. That's what this says. And that's exactly consistent with the second set statement you said, right? Do work on the environment, energy decreases, right? That's exactly consistent with the second statement you said. But it doesn't require that that work that you do releases heat into the environment. That's what this is saying. Does that make sense? Just because you do work on your system, on, on your environment, it doesn't guarantee that heat is leaving the system. 
Does that make sense? I'm also going to mention that we're going to see the phrase approximately adiabatic show up a lot. Uh, delta U doesn't have to be zero in the adiabatic process, though, Troy. If that's what you're talking about. Maybe I lost what you're saying. Yeah, I think you got that right, Amir. You got that right. And you, you should also keep in mind that there are definitely processes where all three things occur, right? Where you do work on your environment, where heat either leaves or enters the system, and the internal energy is changing. The specifically adiabatic is just saying that like no heat is exchanged. And again, I'm going to emphasize that we're going to see a lot of places where we're going to talk about approximately adiabatic processes because the idea that no heat leaves or enters the system it's kind of ridiculous if you think about it. You know what I mean? Um, just just as an example, if, if you if you if you have an internal combustion engine car, so like a normal kind of old style car, right? You turn the engine on, it starts running, right? You're driving down the road, whatever. You get out of the car, uh, it's it's still running. The car is gonna feel hot, right? You wouldn't want to put your hand on the engine because there is definitely heat coming off of that engine. Now, some of that heat is kept within the system and is used um, to provide energy to the car, but some of it gets out. There's no way to contain all the heat. You know what I mean? You're always going to have some heat flow in or out. So we're going to be talking about approximately adiabatic processes. We're going to talk about the portion of a cycle in like the uh, cycle of like a diesel engine, for example, that is adiabatic. So a portion of the process will be adiabatic. And then another portion of the process may dump that heat out later. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, great time to take a break here. So we'll take a break for 10 minutes until 10.51.